What is up, guys? My name is Doug Polk, and welcome back to another episode of Poker Hands, the show where we take famous poker hands and analyze how players should have played. Today, we're going to look at a hand I truly love from the 2015 World Series of Poker main event between Peshka da Silva, I'm sure my pronunciation is bad on that, and Fedor Holtz. On that note, let's go ahead and roll the clip. Good discipline fold, Jarvis. Your live reads are really on point today. So after Fedor opens up the 90,000 at 20,000, 40,000 blinds, the action folds over to De Silva in the big blind, and he decides to re-raise with ace-king to about three times the size of the open. Now, normally I would probably like to see a little bit bigger of a raise out of position. You're offering that in-position player quite the opportunity to flat profitably with a wide array of holdings, such as 8-7 suited. If you make this raise more like 300,000, he can't call with some of these weak hands, and it puts him in a much tougher spot when siding with the do against the three bet. Also, with a hand like Ace King, you don't really want them to see a flop with a hand like Eight Seven suited. They could just hit a pair or some kind of draw, and you're going to have a very difficult time out of position. Not to mention, one out of every three flops has an Ace or a King, but two out of three don't. So at the same time that you want to kind of get some value from your opponent, I think it's more important to use a size that knocks your opponent out of the pot with some of the hands like this, and then post-flop you can play a little more straightforward. That said, it can also make sense to go a little bit of a smaller size because you offer yourself better odds. So when I see this small re-raise, I think to myself, okay, he might want to have more hands in there, make this you know raise with a few more like few more holdings, etc. That said, I don't really like it, and you're going to definitely have to be ready to play a little bit of post-flop, but clearly, De Silva was ready. So Fader decides to flat the 3-bet, and we take a flop of ace-jack-8, two diamonds, and one heart. Now, obviously, this is a great flop for De Silva, with his ace-king having improved through top pair, top kicker, and he decides to bet 345000 for value with his top pair. I like this play. I like the size. I like pretty much everything here. It's not too groundbreaking. Definitely the standard line. When you have a hand like top pair, top kicker, there's so many other hands your opponent could have that are worse than you. You know, hands like ace-queen, ace-10 suited, ace-9 suited, queen-jack, ace-7 suited, 10-9 suited, king-10 suited. 
Definitely on the flop when you have these strong top pairs in various pots, you want to lean towards betting to get value from your opponent. Now, Fader has bottom pair here, and I think his decision is a little bit close, but probably needs to be a call. First off, the Silva can be bluffing with hands like suited connectors, maybe 10-9 suited, maybe a low suited hand with a flush draw. So he's ahead of those hands. And then additionally, if he is up against a hand like ace-king or ace-queen, he still has 20% to win the pot. Keep in mind, the flop bet is a little over half pot, so, you know, Fader needs to win this somewhere somewhere around one every four times, a little bit more than that. But the odds are still pretty good for him, and there is some chance that Silva could be, could be bluffing. He could have a hand like Queens. Uh, that should probably not be betting the flop. But he can have some hands are going to have difficult situations in later streets. And then also he's going to get a chance to play post-flop on some different runouts. So I think the flop was standard played from both players. Let's see the turn. The turn comes the Queen of Hearts, and De Silva obviously has to be a little bit annoyed with the way things are going. King-10 suited has made the nuts, 10-9 suited has made a straight, Queen-Jack has improved the two pair, Ace-Queen has improved the two pair, maybe a marginal hand like Queen-8 suited has improved, and then of course there still are hands like Ace-Jack or Ace-8 or Jack-8 suited that trap the flop that have him beat. So at this point, it makes a lot of sense for him to check. There are simply too many strong hands his opponent can have that will have him crushed. You don't want to be betting thin for value into spots where your opponent can have many hands that beat you. Because first off, you need to be ahead when they call. And second off, you want to let them at least have a chance to bluff. You don't want to just get stacked by the good hands and have them fold otherwise. So the turn check makes a lot of sense. Fedor now has a decision. Does he think his 8 is good enough? Or does he want to turn it into a bluff? And let's kind of think about what worse hands can he have here. Well, he might be able to have a hand like 9-7 of diamonds. He might be able to have a hand like 7-6 of diamonds. He might be able to have a hand like king-9 of diamonds. Maybe a hand like king-8 of diamonds. Uh, although actually, sorry, that's actually a better hand. So, really, there aren't many hands Fedor has that can be worse than this. Which is why I really like this decision to bet the turn from Fedor. They have about 1.2 million left behind, and the pot's about 1.3 million. So Fedor can put some hands into a small bet and then jam river line for value, like king-10 suited, 10-9 uh, suited, ace-queen, ace-jack, all these hands, and then also put a few bluffs in. He needs to find bluffs. Now, you can't just be like, oh, you should bluff the flush draws. There's not that many flush draws. 9-7 nine, nine, of diamonds, you know, 10 10, 7 of diamonds, 7, 6 of diamonds. It's like 3 combos, but king, 9 of diamonds. I mean, it's like 4 combos of hands. There's just not enough diamonds there. So what Fedor needs to do, he needs to pick some pairs and work them into the bluff range, and he wants to pick the pairs that have the worst playability. Well, 8, 7 of spades has extremely bad playability. Can't river any straights, doesn't make very good 2 pairs, doesn't have any flush draw, has no red cards in it. It's just not a good, it's just not a good hand. So taking 8-7 suited and bluffing with it seems like a fair play. The only thing I might say is that he could also have a hand like 8-6 suited, uh, which also might be another hand he wants to bluff with. But you don't want to get too carried away on bluffing all these hands because then you're going to have all these bluffs and not a lot of value. Now in this spot specifically, it's probably fine to do both of these hands because he has so many good hands that would take this line preflop, on the flop, and then on this turn. This is a very dicey situation on the turn for the big blind. The big one's not going to have some of these ace-jack type hands, some of these king Su type hands, nearly as much as the person flatting, because those hands make bad three bets. 
if you three bet those hands and get four bet, you're in a bit of a tough spot. So, when I see this spot on the turn, I really like how both players have played this. De Silva going for the check call and Fadar going for the bet. So, let's see what the river is with only about 800,000 chips behind into a pot that's going to be somewhere around 2.1 million. The river comes the nine of diamonds, completing the flop flush draw, making a one to a straight with a 10. Easily one of the most dicey rivers in the deck. I guess maybe the 10 of diamonds is a little bit more dicey, but other than that, this is it, guys. Shit has gone down. De Silva checks with ace king, as he's going to want to with any hand here. You don't really want to have any bets in the big blind, because the small blinds are going to have way more hands like flushes and straights, so you want to protect all your hands by checking it over to Fedor. Now... Fedor, having bet the turn, now has the most off river jam of all time. He can't really even have worse than this. King-10 got there. The flush draws got there. If he had a hand like 9-7 of diamonds, it's no longer even possible. So he has one of his worst hands in a spot where he can have many good hands. He can have a few flushes. He can have some two pairs. But, but let's actually kind of think about this. Let's break it down a little bit further. What flushes does he really have here? I think it's actually a pretty good question. Because if he has a hand like, let's just say, King-10 of diamonds, that's a very good candidate to check the turn. You have the nuts, you have a redraw, very strong hand. Makes a lot of sense to trap. After that, what diamond hands does he really have? If he has Queen-X of diamonds, he's going to check the turn. If he has 8-X of diamonds, let's say he had 8-7 of diamonds, he has to check on the turn so he can't get jammed on 
by De Silva. So he's actually not really representing flushes, as weird as that seems on this three flush board. And a queen or an eight with a diamonds checking the turn, and because of the way prefob works in a uh, full ring tournament, he can't really have the very low flushes. Now maybe seven six of diamonds or seven five of diamonds or six five of diamonds. Those could be some hands that Fedor can have here. That makes sense. Those hands are okay if they get jammed on the turn, still have some equity, and you know th those can make sense. And maybe even a hand like queen eight of diamonds, a hand that turn to pair with the diamonds, but these are all just one specific hand, right? So when we think about Fedor's jam, he's not really saying he has diamonds. He's saying he has a straight. But let's think about the kinds of straights that are here. He doesn't have ace 10, right? That's going to check the turn because if you bet ace 10, get jammed on, what do you do? He doesn't have a hand like queen 10 because if you bet and you get called, you're now bluffing with a pair. It doesn't really make sense. He doesn't have jack 10. That hand checks the turn. He does have 10-9 suited. That hand will for, for sure play this, this line. He's unlikely to have 10-8 suited. That hand's probably going to check the turn. Uh, he doesn't really have many 10s. Many he could have king-10 specifically, but it might trap turn. But I'll say that's a possible hand. And he can for sure have 10-9 suited. So he doesn't really have flushes, and he doesn't really have straights. And this is interesting because I still really do like Fedor's line here. I think that it makes a lot of sense. It's one of his weakest hands. But if Fedor is deciding to use 8-7 suited and 8-6 suited, as well as maybe a couple other floats, uh, maybe he has a king-7 of diamonds type hand preflop. I'm not really sure how he's going to play this preflop. But the point is, if he's going to have 8-7 suited and 8-6 suited, that's already six combinations of hands. He doesn't really have that many straights or flushes. It's like 12-ish combos. Now, here's the thing. How much thinner than flushes and straights can Fedor go? If he has ace-queen here, is he going to play for it? And I'm not entirely sure what the answer to that is. You now lose to 10-10. You now lose to um, a trapped queens. You 10's not really being the flop. Maybe not 10's. You lose to queen-10, though. That could be a hand you could lose to. Maybe you don't lose it. Maybe you don't lose it many times. This is what makes the hand so great. I, I just, I'm thinking about it more and trying to decide how thin would they go. And if Fedor's planning on going thin here with ace queen and ace jack, which as I think about this sounds more reasonable, because neither player really has that many tens, then all of a sudden this buff becomes extremely good. Because if he has those value bets in conjunction with those flushes and straights, he easily has enough value. And that's really the point. You always want to make sure you have enough value so that you can bluff with a few hands like 8-7 suited or 8-6 suited. So uh, I like Holes' play here. It makes sense. Uh, I'm on board with the whole hand pretty much. I, I really like how he played the hand. Now back over to De Silva. He has an extremely difficult situation with Ace-King here. This is really kind of the nightmare, the, the classic nightmare Ace-King spot. Like, you even flopped an Ace, and, like, shit's just kind of gone down. Like, what can your opponent have? Now, I'm going to say what I think Silva should do here in general is fold a hand like Ace-King without a diamond because he doesn't block the flushes. Uh, although maybe that doesn't, the diamond doesn't really matter that much here because... Fedor's not representing a flush anyway. But in general, if you wanted a simple way to play these river spots, you should check call with these hands when you have a diamond and check fold without. And that is going to be a little bit too much folding on boards like this and a little bit too much calling other, other places. Uh, I, I want to kind of give you guys like a simple general idea of a way you could try to play this without, you know, before I go into like really specific things. But the point is, if you always call ace-king, your opponent can just value bet, value bet you really light. And if you always fold, they can run it with these suited connectors a lot. So you have to figure out a way, right, to split that up. And I think that that just means having a diamond in your hand because then your opponent is even less likely to have a good hand. So I think what De Silva has decided in this hand, I could be totally wrong. I'm not sure where he's at. But I think he's decided that Fedor doesn't really have diamonds because those hands probably check turn. Uh, he doesn't really have straights because those hands check turn other than 10 suited and maybe king 10 suited. And then he may or may not go for value with hands like ace-queen. And if he thinks that Fedor is not willing to go thin with a hand like ace-queen here, then he might decide that he is really only going to be up against bluffs. So I would like to see – I like how Fedor played this hand. Uh, I like – I like De Silva calling with some of his ace kings. Uh, it's kind of hard when we look at a situation and we're like, oh, he probably has to call some and fold some. 
It's like, okay, so what does that mean? Like, you only get to play it one time, right? And, and this is kind of, I guess, like the greater poker concept that you guys can take away from this video. But just because you make a decision in one hand doesn't mean that you should always make that decision. That can make you exploitable because players will be like, oh, yeah, that guy can't fold an ace with ace-king. Because obviously there are points on some boards where you should fold an ace. And I'm not sure what kind of reads De Silva had on the way that he thinks Fedor is playing different spots either. That could change things entirely as well. But at the end of the day, with Ace King in this spot, you're in a tough spot. And when the, when the decision is very close between two options, it's usually good to take a mix of both. Because that way you avoid being exploitable. Now, maybe there's other things going on. Maybe there's live reads. I don't know, guys. I'm just the theory guy. If you want live reads, there's probably someone out there for you, but it's not me. I don't know. Holes was doing a lot of staring him down and kind of looking at him. And, like, it's actually kind of weird to me. Like, when you fire the river, like, when I jam a river, I'm just staring at the table, right? It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me to stare your opponent down when he's looking at you for reads. Like, you don't need reads. Like, why... Why are you doing? It doesn't. It doesn't make sense to me. Hide, man. Hide. No, but seriously, like when I go all in the river, I try and like pick a spot on the table to stare at and just like not sweat it. I'm not like looking at my opponent. You're just giving them an opportunity to like make re make decisions about what they think you have. Now maybe he thinks he can win the leveling war. Maybe he thinks he's not going to be any different. Maybe you know when he's bluffing or not bluffing. But the point is, I don't really like that. I I feel like there's no value, and unless you're Scott Seaver and can talk your way out of it. I don't really understand what you're trying to gain here by, you know, looking at your opponent at all. So those things aside, because I have no knowledge about that, I think this hand could be okay sometimes, but it should not always be a call. Anyway, I thought this was a really cool hand. I'm glad I got to review it here today. Uh, thank you for joining us for Poker Hands. If you're interested in more high-level analysis of famous poker hands, click that subscribe button and join the team. However, this bet works out perfectly because now Pete decides to put in a float here with the nine high. When someone bets in the in a pot, even if it's only half pot or less, or a little bit more than half pot, I guess it is what it is here. You need to keep one thing in mind. 